Good morning. Welcome to the BYU Real Estate Webinar Series. My name is Barrett Slade, Professor of Finance at the Marriott School of Business, and I'm the host of today's webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to announce that on December 2nd, we'll hear from Nobel Coker, who resides in Saudi Arabia and currently leads the development and expansion of the Diplomatic Quarter, a very large and complex development. His presentation is titled Building Paradise in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Sounds like a unique and very fascinating topic. We'll be sending out an invitation to that webinar in the coming days. Please note that after our guest speaker concludes at 11.35 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll conclude at 11.45 a.m. If you have questions for the speaker, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to those as time permits. So today we have with us Crystal Call Magalette who is CEO of FJ Management, a diversified family business that includes a wholly owned subsidiaries Maverick Convenience Stores and Big West Oil, a petroleum refinery. She is also on the board of Pilot Flying J, as well as numerous other for-profit and nonprofit entities. She has an incredible story that is direct linkages to real estate and juggling work and family responsibilities. So we thought her presentation would be awesome and very insightful to our audience. Crystal, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks for being with us and you go, go ahead and, and take it away. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, hello everyone. And I'm, I'm excited to share my journey with you. And I'm gonna do that through some slides and I hope you can all see them. I'm gonna assume that you can. Um, I'm gonna start, well, I'm gonna to hope to start if I can, oh, yes. Um, so this is where I came home in 1964 actually to this station in Willard, Utah. And there was a trailer next to it where my parents lived. And we'll refer back to Maverick, that Maverick sign. But this is where uh, I had very humble beginner, uh, beginnings in Willard, Utah at a Maverick station. Our family was amazing. We had a boy and a girl and you know, a dad and a mom, just like all the sitcoms on TV back in the 70s. And you know, for fun, I felt very privileged that we would get to get in my dad's plane and fly to California to Disneyland and stay in Motel 6. That was, I felt extremely lucky and had a great family. When, I, when it was time to go to work, I went to my dad because my brother had worked at one of our convenience stores at Flying J. And I went to him and I said, can I, can I go to work at one of the convenience stores? And he told me there's no way I could do that, which, which gave me, I guess, rebellion. I don't know. I went and got my first job at McDonald's. I went to Utah State University for a couple of years had an amazing time um, enjoying Logan, Utah and the campus life there. I graduated from Pepperdine University with a degree in marketing. And my first job was at our family business at Flying J in Brigham City, where I bought and sold butane and uh, LPG products for our refinery, as well as did grand openings for our new travel plazas that were build, being built across the country. I went on to Harvard Business School, which is an amazing experience, um, met some amazing people there. And actually for the first time, I found myself with other women who also were very ambitious. And that was one of the best things I took away from Harvard Business School besides a fantastic education. So I was going along, that was a quick view through my late twenties. Um, I was living in, uh, Stanford, Connecticut, just outside of New York City, when, and, uh, and I was 28 years old, and I got invited to a wedding, and it was in Calgary, Canada, and my father said to me, who was in Utah, he said, you know, I've got an opportunity I want to discuss with you, so when you come through Utah, please stop by, and I said, okay, I'm going to this wedding, so I went to the wedding, and at the wedding, I met my husband who would become my husband a year later. I actually had known him in, at Harvard Business School. We had um, three classes together and this is pretty interesting. Um, we had real estate, entrepreneurial management and service management, which was a customer service type class. Of course, 
we didn't get what fate was trying to tell us when we had those three classes together. It took going to a wedding uh, together to figure out that we were meant to be together. As I said, I stopped in Salt Lake and my dad mentioned to me that he had an opportunity to build a hotel in Salt Lake City. And my dad, to give you a little background, my dad really, what he was really great at is real estate. He could pick a site for a truck stop or a hotel or a restaurant like no one else. And really he did it in probably a very different way than the way you would be trained today or you would even go about it. To my knowledge and what he told me, he would go sit by locations and watch the traffic patterns, just visually watch them. And that's how he would decide on sites. The interesting thing and in his uh, vision for this site in downtown Salt Lake, which hopefully a lot of you have seen on Fifth South, it took, it took nine parcels being put together to have a place for this 175 room hotel in downtown Salt Lake. So when I came on the scene in uh, July of 1993, um, I found a bunch of buildings that had asbestos problems. I found a lady that owned a home that really didn't want to share her parking with us. I found another resident that just was willing to get out but wanted a lot of money. And it was a very um, baptism by fire, I guess, in, in my entry into the real estate and development business, but it was super exciting. And it was my own project. My dad was an entrepreneur that really different than many entrepreneurs. He would just stand back, let people do their thing and be there if you needed him. So the first site was in downtown Salt Lake. Um, this is what it looked like. You can see those cars. This is an older picture of the property, but it opened miraculously it opened in around six months um, from when we started building it, which when I think about that today, I can't believe that I was naive enough to think we could get it open because we actually had contracts for a convention that filled the hotel really within a couple of days of opening it. Um, luckily, I was naive, I guess, because we did get it done, but it was not easy. Um, so our second hotel actually was in Logan, Utah. And this is a picture in August of 1995. We're breaking ground on that property. Um, you might notice that my stomach looks like I maybe swatted, swallowed a watermelon because not only were we growing our hotel business, we were actually growing our family. And our first son was born three weeks early, not long after that picture. And as you can see from these photos, you know, cardboard boxes in your convenience stores of the hotel work great for your child and first steps in hotel corridors are great too. Um, it was great having one child still working to build our hotel company. And then this is another picture of a property we opened. We we're cutting the ribbon on in West Valley in 97. And as you can see that that baby's getting bigger. And again, I have a problem with my stomach and literally the next day, this time there were two. And as we developed these hotels, we kept developing our family only the next time we did it two at a time. And I had twins in September of 2000. It was a wonderful time for my husband and I, we we're working together on the hotels and we managed and built 14 hotels we like to refer to as inconveniently located from coast to coast because we had one hotel in bakersfield california and another in northeast maryland so we were located across the country with most of our properties being in utah we had a very happy family life was very good um, we were fortunate enough to do many trips and adventures one of my favorites was when we had the opportunity to go to Africa together. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to talk about Flying J. So Flying J started in 1967. My dad had actually worked, you saw that Maverick sign, and I'm going to refer to this a little bit now. You saw the Maverick sign where I was born. My dad had actually worked for his father and his uncle for many years in the Maverick world, uh, Maverick was growing and my grandfather had passed away suddenly of a heart attack in 1964. So my dad had worked for his, with his uncle for a few years and then decided to go off 
and start himself or do his own thing in 1967. And what he decided to do, he decided he would build self-service stations. And in 1967, that wasn't really a thing. Um, and many on the phone would not know that, but maybe you see old movies or pictures where people wore white coveralls and they pumped your gas and took your money and you went on your way. My dad went to California, again, going back to his knowledge of real estate, he bought relatively small pieces of land. He built cinder block buildings with a window, pass through window, and he hired retired couples, somewhat retired. He hired retired couples who would live in these facilities and he developed a mechanism that they could switch the pumps back to zero, um, whatever they paid, and they would come up to the window. Uh, there was another sort of not very sophisticated machine that would say what they owed and they would pay. And then these retired couples would, would get a commission from what they, they got from these self-service stations. And my dad began to grow that business. He could actually build one of these and the money that he would, and he'd start, he'd open it, he'd start making money. And before he, he could use that cash flow actually to build the next one before he had to pay the suppliers of his fuel. So he was definitely working off the cash flows he was making. And he built uh, many of these in Washington, Oregon, in California, which the reason he went there is because he did not want to compete with his uncle and Maverick at the time. And also, I think he, he loved to fly and he always had planes. I think he just wanted to be able to get in his plane and fly also. Um, because the company was growing, we got into transportation, bought our own trucks to supply the fuel. We found, we bought a refining company called Thunderbird in the early 80s. We got into exploration and production. And we became very, by night, the early 80s, we became a fully integrated oil company that had exploration production through retail facilities. And along the way, one of my dad's executives said, you should really start building truck stops, which we call travel plazas. So in 1979, we completed this travel plaza. Many of you probably passed it. It's right off of I-15 and 21st Street in Ogden. And it was a huge success very quickly. And my dad knew that he and his management team were on to something. So in addition to the travel plazas, a lot of other businesses came along that supported the trucking community, um, mostly the owner operators. But we built many additional and started many additional businesses to support the transportation industry. And the travel plazas became more and more beautiful and more and more of a great stopping point for America's travelers, both 18 wheel and four wheel. And the network grew all across the country. My dad unfortunately passed away in 2003 in a plane crash. Uh, it was obviously extremely traumatic to me and our family. But the one thing that my dad had done is he had actually stepped away from managing the company day to day several years before that. And so we had a professional management team at Flying J. So I wasn't too worried about the company, but of course I was heartbroken about my father. So the company was made up and you can see that one of these things doesn't look like the others. I was on the board of directors, but I was one of the only, well, I was the only woman in any sort of governance or management position at Flying J in the early 2000s. So what did I do? I was a member of the board of directors I attended a monthly management meeting where about 100 managers would stand up from different subsidiaries and talk about what they're working on. Each year, because there were around 12 subsidiaries, I would meet with each one once a year um, and learn more about who they were and the executives in each of those divisions. But I didn't have any day-to-day -day responsibility at Flying J. After my dad passed away, we bought two, we had two additional acquisitions, the Longhorn Pipeline, which we really had never had any, done anything with pipeline businesses. And even though we, we had some refining experience, we bought a refinery in Bakersfield that needed a lot of work. And we began to put hundreds of millions of dollars into a plan to upgrade the refinery without the proper permits that we would have needed to get that, make that happen. 
but things looked really, really rosy. Um, we were up to close to 20 billion in sales by 2008. And then all of a sudden, when crude oil went from $140 a barrel in July of 2008 to $30 a barrel in December, we found ourselves in a cash crunch at Point J. In December 15th, I was shopping uh, for my kids for Christmas. I remember exactly where I was. I was at a, a ski boat shop buying a wakeboard when I got a call from our general counsel at Flying J who asked me if I knew any bankruptcy attorneys because he had just been on a call with Bank of America and they had requested that we get with bankruptcy counsel because they were going to take us into bankruptcy. It was a shock and I did not know what to do. I flew to New York City to try to raise 120 million in December of 2008, the week before Christmas. There's no way I was going to make that happen, but I did, I was able to hire our attorneys, Kirkland and Ellis. I was able to hire a public relations firm to work with our employees and others on, in the press. And I was able to hire an investment bank all within about two days. So on December 22nd, Flying J went into free fall bankruptcy. And what free fall bankruptcy is, is that you don't have any planning. So when our employees left on Friday, they thought everything was great. They were preparing for Christmas. And on Monday, when they came to work, they were told to go into meetings where they were told that we were in bankruptcy. They had to work extremely hard to make sure we could stay in business because we no longer had credit from anyone. And so we had to operate on our own daily cash flows. And it took all those employees hours to work with our vendors and others to make sure our business could stay alive. We did not have a debtor in possession loan, which is usually what someone would have that would allow them to keep working and have cash flows. So what was I doing after that trip to New York? I would go to Ogden, our headquarters. This is the building in Ogden. Um, and I would do whatever I could do to help support the many divisions of Flying J. And within three weeks, I was asked to become CEO. It was a very, it was drinking from a fire hose for sure. And one of the first things I did, I knew we needed to cut back any cash that was going out. So I held a brainstorming session with those same hundred people that I'd been meeting with for many years, attending the meetings. And I asked them, to come up with ideas of areas that were not necessary to run the business. Um, during that meeting, someone raised their hand and asked why we have to wear ties. And I told the person that we didn't need to wear ties. And I told them to take his tie off right then on the spot. And within only a few hours, there wasn't a tie anywhere in the building. And I don't think we've seen many in our organization since. And the reason I bring this up is because in such a hard time for our employees, this really, brought them together and made them realize that I really truly cared about them and their well-being. Another thing I did is have, of course, now we do this all virtual, but back then we had bi-weekly conference calls because I had a lot of smart people around me and everybody was working very hard and we weren't all aligned all the time. And this was the way that I was able to lead by simply having two calls a week to have everybody talk with one another about what they're working on. The main thing that happened in our bankruptcy that really brought us out of bankruptcy was when we merged our travel truck stops with Pilot, one of our competitors in the Haslam family. We did that, uh, it, we had some FTC issues, but we were able to merge with them and we exited bankruptcy uh, just 18 months after we'd gone in and we were able to pay everyone back 100% plus interest as well as keep some ownership in our legacy travel plaza business. I had no idea when I took on the job as CEO that we actually had almost 6,000 claims and close to 2 billion in debt that we had to pay back to be able to get out of the bankruptcy and pay everyone off. I was very proud that we as a team made that happen. So what did we have left? We had a oil refinery in North Salt Lake, which we still own today it is an amazing asset for us. We had a bank, um, the time was an industrial bank, which is now a commercial bank. And it, um, we still own it today. 
we had a credit card processing company, which very soon after we merged with EFS and then sold off. The good news about this sell was it gave us the opportunity to create a donor advisory fund and really begin to build a, a, I guess, a endowment of dollars that we could start giving back to our communities. We own 18% of Pilot Flying J when we came out of bankruptcy. I thought we would probably own that for many, many more years to come. But in 2017, the Haslam family decided that they wanted to uh, sell most of their ownership to Brookshire Hathaway to Warren Buffett. So I agreed that I, over time, would also sell my interest. So in 2017, we sold 7%. And in 2023, we will sell the additional uh, ownership in Pilot Flying J to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. This is extremely important. Uh, I really felt that, we, that Warren got a fantastic deal on our assets. Um, and I think Warren did too. And it's one of the only deals that he's done in a number of years since things are so price so high. And I just think that's a, with our world, the way it is today, I think it's a very interesting thing to consider as we look to do deals in today's world. So in 2012, I'm in a circle back to Maverick now. In 2012, I happened to be having lunch with my cousin. I mentioned to him that I was still, I would talked to him before about potentially purchasing Maverick, but we were just coming out of bankruptcy and it didn't work out that we could figure out debt and everything we needed to do to make that happen. But my cousin mentioned that he was working on a deal to sell Maverick. I immediately said, well, why are you talking to me? And uh, he began, we began discussions and we purchased Maverick in December of 2012. And it's been an amazing acquisition for us. So it was a little hard when we came out of bankruptcy. We'd been a fully integrated oil company and all of a sudden we weren't. We had sort of a variety of different businesses um, from hotels to banks, convenience stores, refinery, and we needed to do something to bring us together. And so I gathered employees from all the different subsidiaries and we began to talk about what we all had in common. And we came up with the mission, building value to last. And to me, that just means I want to be around for a long time. I want our companies to be generational, not only for our family, but also for the families that work for us. And so um, we also came up with three guiding principles, excellence, integrity, and mutual respect. There isn't one of our companies that these are not relevant principles as we do business every day. So other things we do today, we have diversified. We have quite a large investment portfolio that includes uh, a lot of uh, public market investments. We also participate uh, in, in a lot of private equity funds. You'll notice a few of those actually have real estate if you know um, some of those names. We do some direct and co-investments in a number of different companies. And we have started a health and senior services division where we are in, we are a single LP, sing, single limited partner with a private equity firm. To date, we've bought about eight companies, as well as starting our own senior living and affordable housing division, which is called WellQuest. This is, and I'll just talk a little more about these. Um, we built three new facilities in California. Unfortunately, they were under construction during COVID. But so far, so good. They're all open now. Um, and I can take no credit for choosing these sites, but I will say that they are tremendous sites, mostly located. My favorite in Monrovia, California is located right next to a, a active adult community with I think over a thousand residents that really that's been around for 15 years and those residents are ready to move into assisted living. So I think that's, that was a great place for us to build. We also built our first new hotel, which also was built during COVID. It opened in Carson City, Nevada. And yes, I do not have anything in that ribbon cutting 
that would indicate that there is another baby, thank heavens. But um, this is a Stavebridge suite and it's literally the first hotel we've opened since 2001. So it's been very exciting. It has taken off like crazy. And I'm very proud of those that encouraged me to build this hotel. So where have we come from? In 2008, we're, we had 2000, sorry, we had 16,000 employees, 13 billion in sales, and our net income was 110 million. Today, we have 7,800 employees, a little over 3 billion in sales, and 520 in net income. We are a much different company, but what I'm very proud of is we are much more profitable today than we were way back then. What is my secret weapon? I mentioned that Chuck, my husband, started the hotel company with me. Extremely smart, very analytical. Not only is he an amazing husband and father, but he also today runs Maverick. He's the chief adventure guide, we call it, of Maverick. And he's helped us build from, we had 240 stores in 2012. We had another CEO for a little bit, but Chuck's been there five years. We now have 370 Mavericks, and I hope many of you on the call are familiar with Maverick, and I hope you have your favorite Mav. Most people do. And that is the end of my prepared remarks, and I look very forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Crystal. That is a tremendous story. I, uh, uh, previous uh, to opening the webinar today, I was telling you that I I uh, read your book and I would recommend this building value to last that Crystal's has written a phenomenal story um, and just highly recommend it. It's uh, I was uh, uh, caught by the occasions when you ran into some disappointments um, from some individuals who were trusted and uh, could you speak just a little bit about uh, that? I see one of your mission statements is integrity and how important that is uh, uh, to building something that will really last. Yeah, I think that, you know, if you don't have trust in people, you have to have trust, but it can, you, you run into situations, unfortunately, that sometimes you don't, people around you maybe are not as trustworthy as you would like. And that was certainly the case with Flying J. Um, my dad had groomed me to really respect and trust uh, the CEO that we had for over 15 years. Um, and it's not that this person did horrible things. It's, it's that the decisions that were made were not the best and that the person had an ego, which is, wasn't great. He was confident, but he also had a very large ego. And in the end, he really couldn't be trusted because his ego really kind of took him away from doing the right things for the business. And what I mean by that is when oil fell from 140 to 30, he probably could see, he knew the company very well, he could probably see we were headed for bankruptcy. And instead of coming to the board or coming to us as owners and saying, hey, we're having some problems. He just went about his business to try to save the company, which sounds admirable, but it wasn't gonna be possible. And he just could not be trusted to bring those not such a good story to us. Um, and that's super sad to me, but as I go forward, I really still want to trust people. And my nature is just to trust people. And I couldn't be running a business like that, like this, if I didn't truly trust people today. But it is important that you surround yourself with people that you do trust. And when you see that their integrity is not really in line with yours, get out fast because Great. it doesn't end well. I don't know if that's that's what you yeah. wanted. <laughs> no, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. We have one question that came in. What do what impact does fuel cost have on operating revenue and the value of your properties? That's a very good question. And actually, the the cost, the actual price you see on the pump really doesn't impact our margins very much. It is a direct result of what we have to pay or what a refinery is paying for crude oil. So when your prices go up at the pump, it's much more about that 
And what we're paying for the crude, the gasoline and diesel that's being manufactured, then it is about us making additional margin. So even if gas prices are fairly low, our margins can still be fine. Um, and even when gas prices are high, sometimes our margins could be not good at all. So it really is much more, the prices you see on the street are much more in relation to what crude oil prices are. So if you follow crude oil and you see that it goes up and down, you're gonna know that prices at the pump are gonna go up and down right alongside that. Interesting, thank you. We have another one. Um, is the push toward electric vehicles part of your internal strategy and discussions? It definitely is. Um, we have eight Maverick locations that we've put charging stations. We partnered with Rocky Mountain and we watch their utilization. And at the moment it is about nothing. Um, we will continue to monitor that. Really one of the questions I have is, we will provide whatever we need to provide for the traveling public in, and communities in the future. The question is, is it gonna be electric? So, you know, until we see people really migrating that direction, because what if it's something none of us on the call even know today and we don't end up with electric, we end up with something completely different due to technology that comes about. Um, as many of you probably know, electric is not the best because we don't have enough electricity, because sometimes it comes from coal and numerous other reasons, it may still be what leads the pack, but we aren't ready to go put charging stations at all of our facilities right now when the utilization just isn't there yet. Interesting, thank you. Um, we have a, 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 a couple of questions from the women on the line who are asking questions about family and work balance and how you've navigated these waters. What was probably your one of your biggest challenges and and yet opportunities, for example, and yeah, and so I, you know, um, after I had the twins in two thousand, I actually stepped away from Crystal Lens a bit. Um, I still was on the board at Flying J. I still participated in uh, high level meetings at the Crystal Lens, and but I wasn't doing anything day to day at Flying J or Crystal Lens when the kids were zero to our twins were eight. When I And so it was a bit of a shock when I stepped back into a full-time position that I was working 60 hours a week and traveling the country. Um, my kids were eight to 13 during that time. Luckily for me, I had always had housekeeping help and help around me. I didn't have a lot of family in town, but I, I, had, I was used to using others, um, hiring people to help me. And I really had to rely on that a lot. Um, I think and, you know, and like many of us, men and women, you feel bad not being there for your kids every single minute. Um, for me, my priorities were that I really tried to set aside weekends and any event, whether it's a dance recital, a, a, you know, a, a soccer game, but I wasn't able to pick my kids up from school. You know, I wasn't, I, I had to give that task to someone else, um, you know, and I, I think that really, if you want to have a career, it's really about both men and women. It's both, it's about men and women working together. Just like I said, my husband is my secret weapon. You know, we both have corporate high level executive positions and our kids since they were eight to 13 have really just seen us work super hard and travel. And they have had a lot of people in their lives who have helped on that journey, um, whether it's driving or cooking meals or whatever it was. Um, and I think that if you, if a person wants to have that high level career, whether they're a man or a woman, it, it does take some figuring out and, it, and going back to that trust, it takes trust and the willingness to allow others to help along the way to, to raise a great family. Um, fast forward to today, I, we've raised four amazing kids, very independent kids. Our son is 26, he's married. He actually just came to work for a WellQuest one of the companies you saw a couple of months ago, before that he worked at Zions Bank. He graduated from University of Miami right on time in four years. Um, he's married to a wonderful fifth grade teacher. Uh, our daughter that's turning 24 on Sunday graduated from USC in California um, at, uh, in 2020, which was unfortunate for her, but she has a great job at Cicero Consulting here in Salt Lake. 
And the twins are 21 and seniors at Notre Dame. They'll be graduating in May. Uh, one of them is, has a job in real estate in Denver and the other wants to be a physician's assistant. So um, I, I like to share that because in spite of not being a full-time mom and being able to have a fantastic career myself, I really feel fulfilled as a mom too because I think our kids so far are doing amazing things and becoming great adults. So um, that's a long answer to the question, but I think it's a really important, uh, I think it's important that people of the age that are on the phone know that you can do it. You can, you can, you can all have a career if that's what you want. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I have another question here. Uh, what are some of the characteristics that are important when selecting the site for a Maverick store? So, you know, I think a lot of it goes right back to what my dad would look for. You know, we like corners, we like busy corners. Um, we like to make sure we have a lot of access. Some of you may know and have seen that there's some cases where we have Mavericks across the street from one another. Um, I know we have that in Logan. We have it, I think, on 90th South. And that's happened because in those, a couple of those locations, we don't have good access from each side and yet they're still super busy locations. So um, those are some, the demographics of the area, you know, do the demographics fit? A lot of our employees are blue collar. Um, you know, does that fit our demographics for that area? Um, but, you know, in today's world too, it's where can we find sites and where do we have to go to find sites? I actually, in preparing for this, I, I asked our Maverick folks, you know, how many sites have we made offers on this year? And they told me we made offers on 150. And I said, and how many have we closed? We've closed 30. So you can imagine the amount of work and effort it takes to maneuver through 150 offers to end up with 30 sites. So there's definitely a lot of uh, analytics involved today too. Uh, there's definitely three or four people that do nothing but run numbers on those sites and, and make do projections and things much different from when my dad was involved. Oh, thank you. Um, here's a, a question. Uh, what are some of the property trends that you have seen change during your career? Property trends difference. I see, of course, that you're now getting into senior living even. Uh, but anyway, just speak to that general question. Yeah, you know, I'm probably not the best to talk to that, but I'll, I'll kind of give you my observations. I'm looking out the window in downtown Salt Lake, and I'm seeing a lot of multifamily. Um, and prior to COVID, I think we saw a lot of migration to cities. Um, I don't know what impact COVID will have on that. Uh, I also wonder about the affordability of homes for people. And, you know, will there be opportunities to have developments that have homes that rent because people may not have the ability to have a down payment for a home, but they might want a home. And I think some of these trends, I think, are out there. Um, you know, yes, assisted living has been something going on for a long time. I think for us, I really hope to get into active adult, which is also kind of a version of multifamily. Um, but I do think that that is one of the things I, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch what happens to office space. Um, I think it's still a work in process because we don't really know I actually think we kind of do know there's going to be some sort of hybrid working for people. I don't think people are going to be willing to go back to work five days a week, at least be forced to. I think they're going to want flexibility. And I don't know what that's going to do to commercial office space. Retail, you know, retail is another one that there's just so much transition in real estate. And I think with our transition, there's huge opportunity to sort of try to follow those trends and get ahead of them, whatever those new things are going to be and new needs and demands. Great, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. What is your best and worst performing Maverick store and what might be some of the drivers behind success or lack thereof? Well, I can, I, I'll give you, I'm pretty sure I might not get it exactly right. I'll get the worst performing one right. The worst performing one is in the building I'm sitting at on State Street in downtown Salt Lake. And a lot of that is because it is the only store that we do not offer fuel. So it is our only standalone convenience store. 
and it makes money barely, but it does cash flow. But we really need the fuel to make it be completely successful. One, if not our best store, I would imagine many of you might have stopped in. It's in Fillmore, Utah. It has a place for pets, a very large restroom facility. But that is one of our um, most successful stores. It's definitely in the top five. And what would make that unique? Just the interstate and the... Yes, the yes, the traffic patterns. Yeah, interstate, you know, our brand name. Uh, you know, it's just in, it's just positioned in a place that just drives so much traffic and right. people like, hopefully like the service they're getting the food. Yes. Thank you. Um, here's one. What are some of the, uh, hold on. what are some of the property? Oh, we covered that. I'm sorry. What are some of the key skills needed to lead a team like you have assembled? You know, I think that Analytical skills in today's world are super important, but you know that's not a leadership trait, but I do think that's something that technical skills are more and more important um, to about anybody because uh, there's just so much data out there and understanding how to manage that data. But the harder thing, if you have that skill, you can acquire that skill, but the harder thing is understanding how to manage people. And I think like I mentioned earlier, I think COVID is gonna make it a little more difficult to understand uh, how you manage people and the things they want and help their careers to grow. But I do believe that listening to the people that report to you, making sure that you're in tune with their ideas and that you take a lot of their ideas, not take, that you build together as a team, that you incorporate their ideas. For me, really my leadership has been all about that. Um, just going back to the many things I've done, I am not an expert in anything. So all I have is my ability to bring people together to make things happen. And I have to rely on people that are smarter than me every single day. And if I didn't understand that, I would be a horrible leader because I wouldn't even be able to be where I am because I, I have to be able to listen to people. I have to be able to incorporate their ideas and thoughts and hopefully ask intelligent questions and then give them direction. And I think that it's, that sounds relatively simple, but it's not always that simple, but that's, I think leadership is is definitely starts with listening and bringing and listening and teamwork among the people that you're managing. Great, thank you. You know, when I read your book, I was struck by uh, the personalities of your mother and father. Your mother was quite a pistol. She no, you know, no one could tell her she couldn't do something. Uh, she was she could she thought she could do it and she did it. And your dad was the same way. What? What kind of characteristics or attributes do you kind of look back on uh, with tenderness with your mother and dad? Yeah, you know, I think I wouldn't be really where I am today. If someone asked me who my mentor was, it's going to be, I'm always going to say my mom. I think it's very important that people have role models. And, you know, my mom got married two weeks after high school. And so she had no, no formal education. And that didn't stop her from doing anything. I mean, my dad is the one that I talk about. I mean, he built Flying J, but my mom opened 30 diet center franchises in Dallas, Fort Worth area. She opened a dress stop, a dress store in Trolley Square. I mean, no one, to your point, no one was going to stop her. And even though as a child, I remember being so upset because really back in the 60s and 70s, everybody's mom stayed at home. And and my mom wasn't always there. And I remember it made me so angry, but in the end, I so respect and love her for the role model she was for me. And I really do think she paved the way for me to be brave enough to do the things that I've done. Wonderful. And my dad too, my dad taught me things like, um, you know, the other person on the side of a deal, both people that when you do a deal need to be happy, whether you sell or you buy, both people need to be happy. And if that is the case, that's a great deal. Um, he also was big about listening and treating people right. So I certainly had amazing parents who helped me on my journey, you know, to where I am today. 
Great, thank you. Crystal, we're uh, near the end. Uh, we have students on the call today. Um, is there a, a nugget of wisdom that if you, you picked up along the way that you could share with uh, these young students as they uh, shortly will be entering the workforce? Anything that you would share as a closing thought? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, and this may be obvious, but first of all, you've got to have self-confidence. You've got to believe in yourself. And literally, if you don't have that, you're gonna have a really hard time getting ahead in anything you do, because if you're always second guessing yourself, it's gonna be a problem. And you're gonna make mistakes and don't beat yourself up about that. Just learn from them and move on because it's gonna be okay. But if you don't believe in yourself, it's very hard to have others believe in you. And the other thing I would say along those lines, when I talk about believing in yourself and having confidence, it's not about ego. So just because, you know, someone's out there saying, I do this, I do that, I do that, you know, that is not necessarily self-confidence. In fact, sometimes I would argue it is insecurity. And so as you, it's really self-confidence, I think comes from within. And it's just such an important thing to believe in yourself and to accept that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be okay. As long as you pick yourself up and just try again. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, this has been a treat for us. So all of you who have joined us on the call, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks where we'll, uh, where we'll learn more about development in Saudi Arabia. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving next week and a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.